Hi, welcome to the Skeptic Track. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Dr. Angie. We are very excited to have with us uh, Dr. Hans House, who will be Zooming in from Iowa, um, as one does. So um, um, he's going to tell us about the Plague of Athens. Welcome, Dr. House. Well, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, oh, there he is. Hi. Yes, well, thank you. Thank <laughs> Welcome. you for having me. I know you desperately want to join us here at Dragon Con, but uh, I'm yes. not able to at this point, but maybe someday. Yes, someday. I hope to. Yep. So Dr. House is a professor of emergency medicine at um, Iowa State University, or sorry, um, I beg your pardon, University of Iowa. Um, yeah, the other one. <laughs> I beg your pardon. I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, and is going to give us a very interesting talk about the Plague of Athens. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, so I'm a little bit briefly about me. I am a professor of emergency medicine at Iowa. Um, I studied at UCLA. I um, have a great interest in infectious disease. It's kind of my uh, interest, research interest within emergency medicine. I study the infectious disease aspects of emergency medicine um, and publish on that and emerging infectious diseases. And I'm a history geek. So um, I read about the Plague of Athens, know about the Plague of Athens. And what's really interesting to me, it is a mystery. To this day, we do not know what caused it, even though it had a huge impact on Greek society on the fall of the golden age of, of Athens. Um, and yet we don't know what caused it. Um, so it's a very tantalizing mystery and I wanna go through that and explain that a little bit about, about to you. Um, I'm just gonna do this. Okay, um, this is my daughter. This is my daughter, Sophie Maya House, um, sitting in front of the old Capitol at, uh, which, is a, which is by the center of the campus, the quad at the University of Iowa. Um, I mentioned this because um, her name, uh, is, uh, was, was carefully selected. Um, her name, um, Sophie, uh, means wisdom comes from, uh, referring to the, to the Greek goddess of wisdom, uh, Athena, and who, who always had symbols of an owl and, and Sophie's favorite animal by far is an owl. And Sophie's middle name is Maya. Maya is the Greek goddess of spring. And Sophie was born in, in May. Um, also happens to be the same, uh, Middle name as 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 my as my as as, as Sophie's grandma, so uh, my my mother, um, and see taken together, you could see that this uh, is the you could say her name means the wisdom of spring, which I think is kind of pretty. So we're into this kind of stuff. It's a very geeky household, which is wonderful. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about um, this uh, uh, historical case. We're going to go through some very detailed case just clinical descriptions of this disease. Um, and try to come up with a differential diagnosis of what this could be. Um, and looking at um, some of the impact that disease has had on military and other aspects of human history. And then um, my daughter, who's a major, you know, Greek mythology buff is, you know, probably uh, would be able to give this lecture herself. So um, we're gonna try to learn as much as she knows. Our story begins on the plains of Marathon. Uh, just north of Athens in 1490 BC. And the Persian army of Darius has just landed um, and got on their ships and they're gathering in the very marshy lowlands of, of Marathon. And they, they vastly outnumber the Greek and Athenian army that has assembled on the higher ground above them. Despite this, the, um, the Athenians win a shocking victory and manage to push um, Darius's army back into the sea at this point. Now, um, this is a, an amazing victory, but we, but, um, and weren't they weren't expecting it. Um, in celebration, they sent off a runner, Philippides, um, to Athens to be able to tell the story, tell everybody that, uh, that they've won this amazing victory. Um, so they runs the 26 miles back to Athens and delivers the news, and that the story goes, then he dropped dead. And somehow we think this is a great thing to try to recreate now in a race, running race, um, that we call a marathon. Uh, now, marathon race is 26.2 miles. That's the standard distance. Where do you come up with this distance? That is not the distance between, um, between the Battle of Marathon and Athens, that distance is, is 26 miles. This was the original marathon course um, that was ran in the very first modern Olympic Games in 1896. Um, this is the route. 
And at that time, it was 26, about, about 25 miles. Well, in the 1908 uh, Olympics in London, uh, the royal family thought it would be really great if the marathon started on the lawn in front of Windsor Castle and ended not just in the stadium, but around the stadium in front of the royal box as the finish line. That distance happened to be 26.2 miles, slightly longer. Um, and then soon after that, 921, that became the standard distance for a marathon since then. What's interesting is this was the original marathon course in 1896 from Marathon to Athens, and it's about 25 miles. Well, in 2004, they held the Olympics again in Athens, and they wanted to run the same original marathon course. The problem is now the distance was, was longer. So they added a loop around the Tomb of the Marathon Warriors to uh, ma match that distance. And the 2004 Olympics are very essential to our story, and I'm gonna get to that at the end, and that is called foreshadowing. Okay, so Darius gets uh, gets driven back into the sea. Um, he has to go back to Persia. Um, the wars rage on, but basically doesn't threaten Greece again, Greece mainly again. However, his son Xerxes decides he's going to uh, re take revenge uh, on 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 Greek and, and achieve what his what his what his father couldn't, and he sends an army uh, into the mainland of Greece. Um, and the first place that they're going to encounter the Greek army is in the pass at Thermopylae. And the class, this is what it looks like today. It looked very different um, back in 479 BC. Um, there, were, uh, there was actually much more, the water was much closer up to the, up to the mountains. So the, the narrow, uh, the, the passageway was, re was rather narrow. Uh, the legend goes that um, a small group of Spartans, 300 Spartans, held this pass uh, for three days, um, basically giving the Greeks time to basically mount a, a better defense um, behind it. Uh, and from this, from the story of the 300, um, we get a number of different legends. And one thing that we say in emergency medicine at our institution is to come back with your shield or on it. This means come to work. This means that uh, when the when the uh, Spartan wives would send their 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 husbands off to war, they would say, "Come back with your shield or on it." Being, being carry your shield, carry your shield with you. Um, and if you're not, you need to be carried back with the shield as a corpse. Kind of a morbid idea, but basically fight until you die. Well, we say in emergency medicine, you better come to work with your shield or on it, meaning that if you are so sick that you can't work your shift, then uh, you better be in the ER as a patient, which is a little bit morbid, I know, and a little harsh, but that's uh, come some of our traditions at our, at our institution. Okay. Moving on. So after Thermopylae, the Persian army gets down into the mainland Greece. Um, they get close to Athens and a number of other cities. And the big turning point in this war came at the Battle of, battle of Salamis. And this is, a, this is a, a naval battle. And this is the Athenian general Therm Thermosicles who came up with the strategy that ended up defeating the larger Persian navy at this battle. Basically managed to get them uh, hemmed in in a relatively narrow straits, which means their big numbers actually became a, a hindrance to them rather than a benefit. And the Greeks were able to, to push the Persians out. Now, <clears throat> that's important because Thermosicles identified, demonstrated that Athens' great strength is not its military, not its land military, but in fact, its navy. And it needed to protect its port, the port of Piraeus. Um, so, he, they built walls, and her name recommendation, they built these walls that connected and closed both the port city of Piraeus as well as the capital of Athens. <coughs> so they can protect their, their port and protect their, their, their navy and their, their strength of Athens, which is great, but also means their entire population is contained within this enclosed area. Again, foreshadowing. One of the leaders of Athens at this time is Pericles. And Pericles is revered and known today. Uh, major, major uh, feature in, in pol uh, Athenian politics. Um, and he, at this time, because the threat of Persia had kind of gone away, the 
we back, frequent back to the squabbling between the city states and mostly between um, the states that were dominated by Athens and the do- states that were dominated by Sparta. And they knew, Pericles knew that they were no match for Sparta in open battle. Um, so he wanted to fight a war of attrition and basically bring the population inside those, those closed walls, resupply from Piraeus, and just use um, uh, occasional raids to basically um, prolong the war. Uh, one of the things he's most known for is the <coughs> what's called the funeral oration. Um, and this is a painting of uh, Pericles delivering his funeral oration in front of the Acropolis. Um, it was a browsing uh, tribute to the fallen members of the war. Okay, that's your background. That's your setup. So Persian threat's gone. Athens is kind of closed in inside their, their walls. Pericles is leading the Athenians um, and in this war against Sparta. And then in 430 BC, the plague comes. Now, the reason we know so much about this plague, at least what happened in the plague or the descriptions of it, <clears throat> because of the histories written by Thuc- Thucydides, Thucydides. And Thucydides wrote a very detailed description, which I think is what makes this mystery so tantalizing because there's a really good description of the clinical picture of the disease, yet we can't figure out what it was. So let's go through that. Let's go through that very carefully. Let's see what Thucydides wrote. Let's get a really good idea of what happened um, and see what we can match that up with, with the other known diseases. It began in Ethiopia and above Egypt and then descended into the most of the king's land. It followed sudden falling upon Athens first attacking the population of Piraeus. So imagine, remember that, that you've got those walls, you've got that port city. It, it comes from Africa, comes across the Mediterranean on some ships, apparently, lands at Piraeus, and then from there moves its way up into the population of, of Athens. It came to the upper city as well. Um, there was concern maybe the people had poisoned, poisoned the wells, but the the water supply at this point um, really was independent between the two cities. This was really showing um, a disease that was transmitted across, across ships and then carried um, person to person. And what did it look like individually? That it was sudden onset. Suddenly, healthy men were seized first. So it was a sudden onset, it was a very fast onset disease. They were uh, red with inflamed eyes. Inflamed eyes usually refers to something like conjunctivitis, where there's redness. The throat and the tongue. So you basically you're you've got maybe pharyngitis or inflammation of the of the throat and tongue. An atypical foul breath. Um, the pain then descend into the chest and prevent a severe cough. So it starts as a URI. It starts as epic respiratory tract infection with cough and coryza and conjunctivitis. So that sounds like measles. And then descends into the cough, it sends the chest and presents a severe cough. So then it progresses into an, in like a pneumonia. Then um, it causes vomiting of the bile of every kind um, and re, non, re, non-productive retching. So people were just having a lot of uh, violent spasms of uh, nausea and vomiting. Thucydides also describes a rash, reddish, livid, flowering with small blisters and wounds. That is a very good description for um, a viral exanthem or a rash that's caused by a virus. Um, again, smallpox might cause that, especially flowering. That, that sounds like, like the, the, the pustules you will see with this smallpox, but also may, may the ones that we see in measles or in certain hemorrhagic um, infections. And it describes them as having a tormented and unquenchable thirst. So they felt like they, they threw themselves into cisterns. They felt, people felt very warm, very hot. So obviously a high fever was a big part of, of what happened. When patients died, they as they most did, on the seventh or ninth day. So it, it came on very fast. And those who didn't survive it, they're usually dead within about a week. That's pretty fast. That's a pretty fast illness. Um, it descends the bowels and causing ulceration. I'm not quite sure what that is referring to. It sounds like an like a, a ulceration of the bowels or maybe a lot of diarrhea. And then for those who survive it, it left a mark on the extremities, on the genitals, on the tips of the hands and feet 
um, and some some uh, were deprived of their eyes or loss of memory. Um, the tips of the genitals and hands, uh, that just, to me sounds like gangrene or vascular occlusions, um, something like a meningitis, a bad meningitis can cause, or bad sepsis can cause that kind of clinical picture. Okay, so what does this all mean? That's a lot of information there, a lot of information. What disease matches that? The answer is no, nothing matches that. Uh, there, there are some uh, interesting um, associations as I highlighted, um, but nothing really fits perfectly. And is this because this represents a disease that we know today and was a different format then? Or is this because uh, that this is a disease we don't know about today? Or is it just the description? Um, maybe, you know, description wasn't all that complete or he was um, taking pieces from different types of presentations. So we kind of have to like come up with something that the physicists and a lot of scholars, a lot of scholars have tried to do this. Um, this is just a uh, one list where of, of different people have published on their ideas for, for what some of the diseases may be. But if we try to, if we take the, 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 the disease, if we take the, the, the differential, we take the, the description as our differential. Um, and we, we, t we tie it up with certain, um, certain known diseases, you'll see that some of the diseases really are more likely than others. And if you look at um, on this table, and this is uh, coming from a couple of great papers, so I rec recommend these sources here, um, that uh, you try to, try to put together all of the things that this is described, you'll see that a couple of diseases really matches pretty well, and especially these ones on the right side of this chart, smallpox, me measles, and something called typhus. Smallpox, of course, doesn't exist today, which is great. It's monkeypox, but on a really bad scale. Measles, which we, of course, know, know today. You don't think of that measles as being particularly deadly, but um, in uh, other populations or in, in uh, populations where people are, are, are have, uh, in, in cases of famine, of course, of course, we are mal malnourished it, or in the young, very young, very old, measles can be very dangerous. Also, maybe a different form at the time. People may be less, maybe more susceptible to measles. Measles, of course, was devastating to the indigenous population of the United States um, or of North America in general when they first encountered them. They didn't have um, uh, immunity against it. So, measles um, in, a, in, a not, in a native in a non-immune population would be would be devastating. That's, that could fit. And epidemic typhus. Typhus is transmitted by a by a louse, by the body louse, by a um, and something that's going to be associated with uh, crowded conditions. Um, with, with It's transmitted on like blankets and, and hairs. You see that in, in, in military situations all the time. I hear about epidemic typhus. So that definitely fits a lot of the descriptions. Another way to look at this is by looking at some of the epidemiologic clues that are given in the description or in the histories of this illness. And this particular article um, tried to do that. And it um, identified a couple of features. For example, going through some of the descriptions of the various um, events, we identified that the attack rate um, incubation period is probably uh, five, about five days because there was a group of uh, soldiers that were set off from Piraeus to go to Thrace at the time um, in, that, in that first year of the, of the illness. And about five days out into their expedition is when the outbreak started on their ship. So we actually knew exactly how, how long it took. And if that group, about 25% of those soldiers died. And across the board, um, in different sources, the mortality rate seems to be at 25%. Um, also, like the timing of like um, when these outbreaks occurred, there was an outbreak in that very first year, which is May of, of 430. And then again, um, in the following summer and then subsequent winters. So not a clear seasonality, but definitely a periodicity of that illness. This is very clearly a person-to-person -person transmitted disease. Um, it's probably a respiratory transmitted disease, um, much like COVID, but um, it could also be transmitted as something that's, that travels very closely, in this case, like a louse. So it could be this, uh, that could be a vector because that can transmit again within a closed environment. Where we've got a lot of people in the same place. We've got an entire city huddling together inside a wall, in, inside a military situation. 
You know who else was the, who also who also was there at the time was Hippocrates. Hippocrates was in Athens, and um, uh, he took off. He said, "I'm out of here," because uh, patient, uh, physicians, healers, were getting sick from the, this illness again. Clearly transmitted person to person. Um, so he le- he leaves. He goes back to the Isle of Kos. Um, that's where his school is. So this is the first. Uh, this is the ruins and the Isle of Kos of the first medical school. Um, this is what uh, Hippocrates probably looked like. He is, of course, most known for the Hippocratic Oath, um, which is a tradition in medicine to take. Um, but do you know what the Hippocratic Oath actually says? I mean, not there's one today that all medical students take in some form. And if you look at the program at those um, events, they'll say something like uh, modern version or updated version of Hippocratic Oath or something like that. Um, so I did find this source um, as a translation of the original Hippocratic Oath. I swear by Apollo Physician and Escapolis and Hygieia and Panacea. Now, who are those people? We'll get back to that. And all the gods and goddesses um, that I will who he has taught the VS art, I will eat with my parents. So it's really a reverence for those who teach the, the, the art of medicine. Um, and they will share the information without fear covenant. So uh, you're supposed to teach without actually expecting a fee. Um, I don't think medical schools really do that today. Um, I, will, uh, I will never give a deadly drug to anybody who asks for it. Okay, that's probably a good thing. But similarly, I would not give a woman an abortive remedy. So that's actually in the original Hippocratic Oath. I will not use the knife. Not even suffers from stone or the doll of favor, etc. And so it's really, it's, this is about, um, this is an oath for um, medical physicians, not surgeons. Um, whenever house I visit, I will come for the benefit of the sick, remaining free of all intentional injustice. That's a very nice sentiment. Um, and in mischief and particular sexual relations with both female and male persons, be free or slaves. That's good. I'm glad you're not having sex with your patients. Okay, so who are these original people? Paulo, Asclepius, Hygieia, and Panacea. At the Acropolis, um, and following the plague, when the plague kind of ended around 420 or so uh, BC or a little before, um, uh, a temple was added to the cult of Asclepius, the cult of Asclepius, um, and say house of healing and worship. Asclepius is revered as the god of physicians. Hippocrates was a real person, a real person who actually wrote some of the principles of medicine, um, who really kind of pioneered the idea of observation of, of patients and symptoms and describing his symptoms, really influenced what Thucydides wrote in his histories. Asclepius is a mythologic free, preacher, a figure. He's not a real person. He's a, he's a myth. But he's considered to be the god of medicine. Uh, he was a son of Apollo. In fact, uh, he, uh, his mother was killed while he was still in the womb, and uh, he was cut out of the womb to be saved. And that's the name. Asclepius means, means to cut out. So uh, he was basically born a cesarean section. Uh, he was taught by Chiron, who is the legendary uh, mythologic uh, tutor uh, and centaur, uh, who also taught uh, Achilles and a number of other Greek heroes. And Asclepius' um, children are Hygieia and Panacea. Hygieia is the goddess of health and sanitation. And Panacea is, of course, with the uh, goddess of like basically curing and being feel, feeling better. And it's the term that we call for the term we have for something that that uh, that cures all. You can see that Asclepius has a staff with him. Okay, Asclepius' staff is a rod with a single serpent wind, wound around it. That's not the caduceus. The caduceus is a winged staff that has two um, serpents on it. This is the proper symbol of medicine. <coughs> you'll see it in the EMS logo. You'll see it in the AMA logo. Not the caduceus, which basically because of a mistake from a graphic designer probably about a century ago, um, has been adopted to being used in, um, uh, in military corps and, and nursing symbols as a symbol of medicine. Now, what's interesting about who, ha- who actually wields the caduceus 
um, is, is Hermes. Hermes is the messenger of the gods, and his role is to ferry the souls of the dead uh, into the afterlife. So basically bring them from the world into Hades. So basically guide the dead uh, on their journey. Um, as a physician, um, if maybe you were say, specializing in palliative care or hospice medicine, that might be a good representation. Um, whereas a cephalist was well known for his healing, healing the sick and being able to cure anybody. Uh, and that's kind of the more, the ideal that I, I try to embody in, in my practice in emergency medicine and trying to save people. In fact, Sepolis actually got himself in trouble um, because of the, he was so good. He was so good that he was screwing up the fates, the, 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 the fates that decide the people's lengths of their, their, their life and would cut the string when, at the end of people's life. Um, they couldn't cut the string because Sepolis was so good at keeping people alive. Um, they complained to Zeus. Skeptics started bragging that he could save anybody, and Zeus said, that's enough, and, not, and killed him with Thunderbolt. Okay, back to the story. So I did promise you something about the, about the, Greek, about the Athens Olympics 2004. The Athens Olympics of 2004, um, in preparation for that, sparked a huge construction project all over Athens to try to improve their infrastructure, for good or for bad. Obviously, major... Uh, financial injury to the to the Greek government, however, did create some good infrastructure for the for the games and for Athens. And one of the things they did is they created the subway. And in 1998, they were excavating um, for the subway in this place called Keramikos. And they uncovered a cemetery there. And they dated the cemetery. And sure enough, some of the graves were from 430 BC. This is in fact from the time of the plague so now we have a we have a, we have bodies we have a, we have we have, a, we have a plague pit and what's interesting about this is that if you look at the layers in the cemetery uh when the first people go in the, the deepest layer when the first spies are laid in they are arranged they are in graves they are they are adorned with jewelry etc that kind of thing and then after that they just get placed you know wherever they can Go and then after, on top of that, there are bodies lying on top of ice, and you can see over time how this was just increasing panic in the city as more and more people die. Now we've got bodies; we can test that with DNA, and we can see what the bacteria was or what the organism was that caused this. This is fantastic, and this was done. You guys ready for the answer? Typhoid fever. What? We didn't even talk about typhoid fever. Let's go back to that chart again. So typhoid fever doesn't match this. It is insidious. It grows on, it, it develops over a period of weeks. Um, if there's any rash, it's really faint. Rose spots are very rarely seen in, in typhoid fever. It's not really, not really associated with rash. It does cause abdominal pain and it does cause ulceration of the bowel, but these are like pathologic little patches inside the bowel lining that no observer from the outside would ever be able to see. And dissection wasn't a big thing back in 430 BC. Um, so really, um, and, and the mortality rate was is pretty high, 15%. So it's possible it matched it. But if you compare it against other items, typhoid fever really doesn't match the description that Thucydides described. So is it because uh, it was a different type of typhoid back then? Or is it this was just that, um, that the, the bodies, the three samples that this particular scientific group took happened to be, have been exposed to the bacteria Samulotyphi, which was endemic at the time uh, and, uh, and just was, was cross-contaminated. So, um, other authors have have argued against this particular finding, saying this is this was uh, this study was done improperly, and it's a contaminated sample, or that just was endemic to that area, and it doesn't mean that's what they died from. And I, I agree with that. It doesn't necessarily match everything. So in the end, we don't know. Um. So one of my favorite TV shows was Lost. Um, 
And I liked about Lost because it kept creating mysteries. Like every like season, there was like a new mystery incorporated and the mystery started adding up and adding up. And it was really interesting. And I really wanted to get to the end of that series to know what happened. So what did J.J. Abrams do? Nothing. He just left them. And the ending was terrible. Right? So like no one, like we never got any conclusion. We never got any, any completeness. Um, and that's and that's where I'm where I'm feeling about this disease. But and I think that's part of the fun. We still don't know what this disease is, and maybe we'll never know. But that's mystery is what is enduring. It was was it was tantalizing and was driving us forward. So at least now you can you can you know you know why you run two hundred twenty six point two miles with the marathon. You've heard about the three hundred Spartans. Um, now you know about Pericles. But firstly, Pericles died during from the plague. Um, we know about Thucydides, who described it so well. Um, now you know what the, the symbol of medicine is. It's a single serpent, not, not a double serpent. And that uh, the Hippocratic Oath was very different back then. I'm going to stop there. And I am happy to uh, take any questions or such. So um, you've got a full house here. Uh, let's see if what? we have any questions. Does any okay? There's a microphone out here in the middle of the um, aisle here. Uh, please don't touch the mic. Uh, the gremlins will control it. Um, <laughs> so, yes, you have a question for Doctor House. Uh oh, that one's not working either. Yeah, can we turn up the sound? Hello. There you oh, go. Oh, there we go. Okay. Not an epidemiologist. I don't know how disease works, but is it possible it was a disease that doesn't exist today, or could yeah. it have? Yes, exactly. I think it's, that's and that's a that's a good possibility. I think what's actually more likely is that it is a disease that exists today, but it manifested very differently back then. We know that diseases change over time. Just in our in our lifetime, or just in the last century, we've seen the evolution of, of influenza considerably from uh, from the world killer it was in nineteen nineteen to um, being something a seasonal thing that we deal with today. Um, it is, there are similarities. Um, also syphilis, we know, has changed quite a bit over time as well um, in terms of its pathogenicity and its, and its way it's, uh, it manifests. So this is why, um, this is what gives it credence to like something like measles, for example, um, would, would definitely fit pretty well with a lot of the descriptions and just be kind of a different form um, than it was back then. So I'm going to take a little host prerogative. So do you think that that's really a, a function of evolution of the disease itself, or is it sort of an evolutionary bottleneck where it killed off everybody who was very susceptible? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, it, I would just say that it's a it's a natural it's a coevolution between between humans, the human immune system, and um, the environment that that uh, organism, whether it be bacteria, bacteria or viruses, is interacting with. Also, it's going to change if its vector changes as well. Okay. All right. We have another question. Could could that study that they saw the typhoid in, could, could the modern typhoid be like an evolved version of what they saw to be less deadly so that it could propagate and not just kill off its health, its host? And, and, and building on what we, we talked about uh, we, we in the last answer, exactly. I think that's a possibility. However, um, I think it's... I think that's less likely, uh, in my personal opinion. I think it's less likely because, because it's such, that is such a big change. Um, typhoid then, to, fit ma to, to match this easy destruction versus typhoid today, is so drastically different. Um, it's much more likely to be something that would change a little bit um, less dramatically. Could there be other he, he can't hear you. You'll have to be up at the mic. Have they found like other diseases that sh could be interpreted as evidence of typhoid kind of evolving to be similar? I'm not, I'm not aware of it. Okay, next question. For me, it was really interesting to see the practicality in the writing about the disease, and it's easy to imagine like an ancient society blaming some sort of malady on a god or something like that, but they went right to, you know, maybe they poisoned the wells. <laughs> um, did they have like any sort of practical response to it? Like, what did they do? How did they like change the way they live? Whether it was yeah. something like supernatural based or even just practical day to day things? Well, no, that's a good question. And that's something to get into was um, they found that they because because at, at the time they did think that all plagues were coming come from the gods, and they found that because of the uh, plague, 
that was that the gods had favored Sparta in the war. Um, so they, they felt like they were being, that they, they, they were being judged against them. Or certain gods had, had, had favored Sparta in the war. Um, and, the same, and the similar thing, um, very, very similar uh, thing happened in the Trojan War, uh, described in the Iliad, um, that Apollo um, in, in Avengers uh, sent, sent arrows against, against the Greeks um, and uh, to, to introduce plague among, among, the, among the Greeks. Um, practical effects. Um, they, there was a description both in Thucydides and, and of course, and, and afterwards, um, in just the way that the Athens changed, they recognized that that close contact or that close quarters was contributing to the disease. So even though the belief was it was that the disease is transmitted by air or bad air or miasmas, um, uh, that um, still recognized that sanitation and and spreading out and 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 clearing out people was actually really helping, and that and that does does help. Um, be, uh, as we know, so um, they kind of um, not even though they didn't know germ theory, they were able to actually introduce some changes, and that's probably one of the reasons that the plague finally ended. So I know you were talking about the cisterns, and, um, and Dr. House has been helping uh, to set up some emergency medicine residencies in the Middle East, and was able to do a stop over in Istanbul. Were you able to go see that cistern? Uh, and they talked about how they used to have fish that lived in the cisterns uh, in order to help detect poisonings and things like that. Uh, you know, I did visit that cisterns. I didn't know the story about the fish, so that's really that's really cool. Yeah. So um, it looks like we've got some <laughs> other uh, uh, questions. Um, my question is a bit more mythology based. Um, you mentioned that Asclepius, or Asclepius, I'm going to mispronounce the name. Um, is, I, I don't know. It's how to okay, it. it's all Greek to us. It's yeah. okay. <laughs> um, but that he is the son of Apollo. And I, according to the mythology that I'm aware of, Hermes originally got his staff, the Caduceus, from Apollo. So I was wondering if there might be some connection for hmm. why that might be a bit of why the Caduceus is kind of medicinally related in a background. That is, that is fascinating. Um, yes, and um, Apollo is the um, source of knowledge for all this stuff. Um, and Chiron um, is linked to medicine because he discovered the med medicinal benefits of, of, of plants and herbs. That's his contribution. So he's it's, it's, it's all tied in together. That's a really interesting observation, um, and I will, I will, I will dig into that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's got snakes in common, at least. <laughs> so, all right, next question. Um, was it recorded anywhere else, or at least to the same level that it was? Uh, yes, it does appear in other, in other other histories. Uh, Thucydides is the one that we have that is most detailed, and I recognize that there is a challenge or a uh, danger in, 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 in trying to rely on a single source um, because of the biases, because of, of, of the observations of that particular person. Uh, but a number of the um, a number of the elements of the evidence was supported by other sources, mainly the mortality rate. That is pretty that is pretty well established. Twenty five percent across the board in any in the various different settings and subsettings that, that occurred. And what's interesting about this disease is that it didn't break out. It didn't spread to the rest of the peninsula. So even though there was contact with the enemy and with armies of Sparta outside the walls, there was only sporadic disease described in, in other communities. So it re really was contained within those walls. Hmm. All right, next question. Um, I know with typhoid fever, it's typically transmitted through like food or water. Um, and obviously they suspected the cisterns. Is there similar to like a Broad Street pump, like a certain source that they've looked into, thinking that it could have started at? Yeah, that's a that's a really good thought. Um, and Broad Street pump, you're referring to um, the cholera outbreak in London, which in which uh, John Snow, uh, not the Game of Thrones guy, uh, <laughs> took off the, the, the identified through a map that uh, that that the diseases were linked to a particular pump on the on the Broad Street, and so by disabling that water source was able to uh, decrease the cholera outbreak in, in, in Lenin, which is fantastic. Um, yes, good thought, um, if, uh, and they, because they obviously identified the systems. One problem with the water-based theory for this is the disease started in Piraeus, which has its own cisterns, and then progressed uphill, significantly uphill, 
to Athens, which has its own, which had its own wells at the time um, and different water source. So um, it doesn't explain the spread between between the cities. That has to be from person to person. Um, but could there be a reservoir in, in cisterns? That's certainly possible. We we heard descriptions of uh, victims actually going into the water um, and throwing themselves in the cistern, so potentially contaminating the water further. Hmm. Okay. Next question. That was a good question. Next question. Yes. Okay. Hi. Um, so I recall you mentioning how they tested like three of the bodies in the graveyard um, and they all came out with typhoid. But my question is, why couldn't they test more bodies? Like, did they just close up the graves or like w what happened there? Yeah, I, I wish I had been there. I'm like, dude, just, just keep going. Um, <laughs> I, think really I think they were excited. I think they were excited just, just to get a few they had. Um, you know, this is I, I don't I don't know the details, but I'm, I'm sure that there was a significant amount of, of politics involved as um, this was a grave site. Um, the state antiquity site. They're trying to build a uh, major public works in the same same area, um, and it's a body, and it's you know it's it's so they they had probably limited um, supply and funding um, for that for that for that matter. And I really want to go back and test more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that question. Next question. In terms of the victims, was it mainly the soldiers that were there? Was it the women and children? Was it everyone, or was it limited to a certain part of the population? I am so glad you asked that. Um, it is specifically described in the city's writings that it is a bro it is broad based. It is across the board. Everybody. It is women. It is children. It is the soldiers, um, and it's clearly transmitted between the caregivers. Another good question. Everybody great has such great questions. So, um, any other questions? No. Well, um, I think I. Uh, I have learned so much more about that than I had ever thought possible. Thank you so much, Dr. House, for appearing again for us this year. We really appreciate it whenever you can join us. Hopefully you'll be able to join us in person someday. Yeah, let's, let's do this in person next time. Absolutely, 100%. So anyway, um, um, if there aren't any other questions, I'm, I'm going to uh, thank you all for coming to the Skeptic Track here at DragonCon for, for uh, Skeptic Track. I'm Dr. Uh, Angie. We, uh, I would like you to stay safe, stay skeptical, and do no harm. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>